And joining us now in studio, filmmaker Mary Heron. How do you do? How do you do? So how long have you been interested in Warhol and the factory and that whole scene? Well, it seems like my whole life, but I think since I was a teenager and I started, you know. Uh, you know, as I was growing up, Warhol was the most famous artist in the world, I guess, mm -hmm. apart from Picasso. Uh, and also, I remember my parents, you know, my parents, dis my mother, just disapproving of him, so that made him even more interesting. But what was, it that, <laughs> what, what was there to disapprove? I mean, it's so interesting in the film how kind of non-committal he is about things. Well, I mean, I suppose he was very controversial, remember, um, in the 60s, because what I think, and he still is, I mean, people still find it hard to reckon that, that he was a great artist or an mm. important artist because he seemed to do nothing, right? you know, yeah. uh, because in a way his work is about, you know, banality of modern life and, you, you know, brillo boxes and Campbell soup cans. Uh, or, or the films, which are very simple black and white images of people doing ordinary things, mm. sleep, eat, um, or, or sex, you know. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm, you know, I, in fact, I started, I think, when I was, I was a kid, thinking, oh, he, he must be bad, and then being kind of intrigued and coming around and thinking he's actually a very important artist. Was the fact that he was shot by Valerie Solanus the central point of his life as a celebrity? I think it was the cutting off point. It was the turning point in his life. I mean, I think that Warhol before and after the shooting are totally different people. I mean, mm. if you look at photographs or, or filmed images of him, he looks haunted and someone who, you know, he actually physically died on the operating table mm. and came back to life, mm. you know. The doctors managed to revive him. And in fact, uh, just before he died, he gave an interview to an English magazine, and they asked him about dying, and he said, oh, I'm dead already. Mm, mm, mm. And I think there was a, a sense in which he was dead already, spiritually or in some way, never the same after the shooting. Let's talk about Valerie Salinas, okay? The, the, one of the, the, the points of this film is, is a manifesto that she wrote called The Scum Manifesto, The Society for Cutting Up Men. Yes. And it's a, it's a very sort of radical <laughs> feminist track. It also seems a, a bit insane, mm -hmm. but I sense that you have maybe not some sympathy, but some oh, yeah. interest in the things <laughs> that she's writing about there. No, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Scum Manifesto. I mean, you know, people find it hard to take because it does call for the extermination of, of the male portion of the human race and this is extreme it is it is extreme <laughs> okay but um, I mean I think there's various ways to take it and mm -hmm. it, it's um, a mixture of incredible insight and quite you know I think profundity and, and craziness you know mm -hmm. and there are certain writers where the craziness and the truthfulness are, are intertwined it's sure. hard to separate the Absolutely. two Absolutely, and some of the great writers too like Coleridge yeah yeah and so it's you know um, and Arto, I think she's a bit like as well. And, you know, so what fascinated me about her was, is she crazy? Is she sane? Is she brilliant? Is she just nuts? Mm. Um, but there's an analysis of what is wrong with, with society or with, with men, the way men and women behave to one another that mm. is really quite brilliant in the manifesto. Um, and it's been compared to the way Malcolm X analyzed black and white relationships in mm. the 60s in the same way that people sometimes took the most extreme part of, of Malcolm X, you know, and, and ignored the interesting analysis. The same thing with Valerie. I mean, I certainly didn't make the film to say you should go out and, and exterminate the male species. Well, no, and you also didn't make the film to show that this was a rational viewpoint, because you do show her being quite crazy in some At of At the, the end. I mean, when she shot yeah. Warhol, it was, she was delu delusional. Yeah. Um, but she was a very bright, very, I think a brilliant woman, and she had a vision of society. Remember that when she wrote the manifesto, this is someone who had been to college in the 50s, in probably the most conservative era right. of male and female stereotyping. And I think she grew up in a total rage mm -hmm. at being told, this is what a woman is. Mm -hmm. A woman is passive, nurturing, has these virtues. You know, a woman simply could never be an artist because she doesn't have the drive, the courage, you know, mm -hmm. the mental strength and tenacity that, that the male has. You but then know. you show her feeding off the incredible energy and creativity and, and licentiousness, you know, and, and ego of the 60s. Yeah. And the 60s as represented and maybe as, as uh, distilled by the factory, yeah. you know, the, the place where Warhol's art unfolded. Yeah. But was yeah. it fun for you to shoot those scenes? Oh, yeah. No, I love those scenes. Um, and I think for my co-writer and I, Dan Minahan, we did the party scene so that we could go to a party at the factory. Oh, yeah. As we never got to <laughs> go to Because you missed one. it the first time around. We certainly did. Yeah. And, but, you know. In what way did, was Valerie Salinas like Andy Warhol? Because you show a parallel. I mean, there's a scene where they're talking together on the couch and she's talking about her views of sex and she's a sort of isolationist. She doesn't believe that sex is a good thing for, for herself or for human beings. No, and, and neither, neither did he. Yeah. I mean, I think that they, they're, that they had certain things in common. I mean, they had things in their background. They were blue collar. They were Catholic. They, they um, were sort of persecuted at school. They grew up poor. They grew up 
uh, socially awkward, mm -hmm. you know, so they, and, and very, very bright, mm -hmm. you know, underestimated by the people around them. They had that in common. Then I think they both had um, this kind of brilliance combined with an inability to connect with others, mm -hmm. which I think was Valerie and Andy Warhol's personal tragedy, mm -hmm. the, this inability to, re to form relationships with others. Um, and and, there, and uh, resentment of sex was part of that, except, of course, Andy Warhol had very little sex or largely voyeuristic sex right. in his life. And Valerie had a whole lot of sex. As she says, that she was, worked as a prostitute. Yeah. And as she says in her manifesto, it takes a lot of sex to get to anti-sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? That's a good line. There, there's there's a, a wonderful performance. There's many, many, many very fine performances. A wonderful performance by Stephen Dorff as Candy Darling, yeah, the Stephen's transvestite. Stephen's kind of like a pin-up actor. Stephen and made, here he is. He makes a lovely, a fetching girl. He and, does. And he went all the way for it. And, um, you know, he would walk around the set in his dresses and his high heels. And I think he really enjoyed <laughs> No, Careful. <laughs> it's one of those things, though. You know, you put on a dress, you become a different person. Well, you know, also, you know, actors love this. I yeah. mean, you know, actors love to, to drag up. Yeah. And, yeah. And, but the thing, what was really great about his performance is that, you know, he doesn't do it as a modern drag act. He does it as a girl trapped in a, in a boy's body. At a time when that was not understood, when that wasn't, you know, there weren't mainstream oh. movies being made about it no, as there are today. No, it wasn't too unfoot. And yeah. it was illegal to be a trans, it was illegal right. to be a transvestite in New York in the mid-60s. But the real Candy Darling's diary informed a lot of this film for you, didn't Yes, it? we used it. We had um, one of the characters in the film is a guy, is a character called Jeremiah, mm. who is based on a man called Jeremiah Newton, who was Valerie, uh, uh, Candy Darling's best friend and who knew Valerie. And he was our consultant on the film and he wrote several scenes in the film and he provided Valerie, uh, Candy's diaries. And can, scenes where she's writing in her diary, that's the real Candy. Do you feel comfortable with people saying this is an historical film? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It is a historical film. I mean, it's it was a you know a lot of the effort in in the production side was to to try and you know it was fanatically, obsessively accurate about detail. I mean, I once sent twenty extras playing policemen off to get their hair cut because they you know the hair was too. Policemen in the sixties had short hair. It's a fascinating <laughs> film. It's a, she's a very interesting character. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you.